Hello, old and new fans of the Break It Down show. I'm Dragan, beat writer from overseas. I want to introduce today's guest a little bit. He is Michael Heller. Michael Heller is the Lawrence A. Wien Professor of Real, Real Estate Law at Columbia Law School. He's the author of The Gridlock Economy, How Too Much Ownership Wrecks Markets, Stops Innovation, and Costs Lives. He is also the co-author of Mine, Hidden Rules of Ownership Control, Our Lives. It's all about the ownership rules of the 21st century. Who gets what and why? Mine blows out of the water everything we think we know about who owns what. If you want to know more about Michael Heller and his work, just hit play on this episode. As always, don't forget to support the Break It Down show by doing, by doing a monthly subscription. All the money you invest goes right back into the show and helps us grow. In addition, don't forget to support Save the Brave as we battle PTSD. So, without further ado, hit play and find out about Michael Heller. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proof. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. This Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Moran. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. I'm Michael Heller, and you are watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Man, you've got a cool book. I, I love this thing. It's called Mine. Um, I'm going to imitate my dad now, right? And this is going to go right in what you're doing. Well, as a kid, we had things in the house that, you know, it's the house. It's a community thing. You're a kid. Yeah. But my yeah. dad had certain things you did not touch. His um, his old time station, uh, you know, stagecoach model. Yeah. And the calculator that had like the feed on it. And then I remember could, those. Yeah. Yeah. He would look at you and go, this is mine <laughs> and he would yell and he would tap his chest like crazy <laughs> and it would freak me out because i'm like but i'm just curious about numbers and adding and you know um but your book is sort of about these kind of things like ownership and and what it means yeah. let's uh you're all over the uh, airwaves so i don't want to cover everything the same way but let's talk a little bit about the premise of the book the freakonomics kind of aspect of ownership and everything and what you and your co-author and his name is james salzman right there, here's the book i'll put the link yeah. up in a second but let's talk about it so what we realized is that people were kind of scared about stuff it's like, like you were scared of your dad people are scared to think you know ownership that's like law that's boring that's hard that's somebody else's problem what we realized is that 99.99% of your ownership conflicts that you're in, and you're in them hundreds of times a day, they are all outside of the law. They are something that each of us can get access to. It's like whether you're the front of the line or the back of the line, it's what you drink, it's where you live, it's what you eat, it's what you watch and listen to. Ownership is all around us. So our basic discovery was, hey, this is stuff that we can all get access to. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. The uh, one of the you guys opened with a very good example where we have this ownership dilemma, and you talk about airline seats. Now, now my, I, I have a, I want to take a moment and describe kind of my flying philosophy. I huh. don't want to get on first. I'm glad to be last. I won't hold anybody up, but I'm not in a rush to wait in line, to wait in line, to wait in line. And so I let I everybody you. get on. I absolutely have a system. I sit left side of the fuselage in a certain number of seats because I kind of know the pattern of the windows. And I yeah, curl yeah. myself into my little corner, put my head in that little <laughs> divot where that half window is. I have a whole thing. I'll surrender <laughs> the middle armrest all in order to not be anybody's problem. And I've already gone to the bathroom, so I probably won't have to get up the whole flight. Yeah. But I will recline my seat right as uh -huh. we are taking off so that way there's no there's no conflict when you, when you're worried about taking off and everything's going backwards i slide back and that way i'm already back and it's not a problem <laughs> that's sort of how i do it but let's talk about the ownership of that space and what you guys kind of discovered yeah like ownership has nothing fancy like one of the ownership conflicts we all get into is you get on the airplane and you like can i lean back or you or, or you say listen i'm trying to work on my laptop i want to watch a movie and you say, hold it, why is that person leaning their seat into my lap? So that wedge of space is absolutely up for grabs. And you have a strategy, which is lean back, claim the space. I tend to be more a sit up and you know, work on my computer guy. But either way, we both have a really strong story that we're saying. When you sit back, you're saying, hey, that's that wedge of space, it's attached to my seat. That little button, that controls the wedge. That principle is one of just six simple stories that everyone uses to claim everything in the world. It's mine because it's attached to something mine. And I'm saying, get out of my space, buddy. 
get in my space. That space is mine. I possess it with my laptop. I was there first. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. First come, first serve. Those are two more. We've now covered three, attachment, first in time in possession. That little wedge of space, we're fighting over three of the six ownership stories that everyone worries about, everyone fights about, everyone uses to claim everything in the world. And here's the really important thing about this story. It's the airlines that are creating this conflict Uh between you and me over that space. They're doing it for their profit. They have designed, they are real masters. All they have to sell is that inch of space. So they're masters of design. What they've done is they've designed it to sell it twice. Once to you to lean back and that same space for me, for my laptop. And they figure that we're going to be polite and work it out. But that politeness lets them double sell that space. Yeah, this and there's so many great examples of this. You know, even in the foreword, you do it with that, or maybe it's the first chapter when you talk about the uh, the rocking chair, and you think about. So just uh, I'll just do the story real quick. There, a, a dude dies. His kids fight over the rocking chair to the point of going to court, because one of the siblings grabs it. The other one's like, "Well, I'm going to go sue you for it." So now. We're spending, I don't know, what would you guess, Michael? Are we spending $500,000 on this process to have the court manage the uh, negotiation of this chair? And then, I, you know, you know, I mean, it's so much money. Crazy. <laughs> like, it's crazy. Like, this is one of my basic lessons for law students. Never go to court. Never go to court. If you go to court, everyone loses. Like, work it out. And 99.99% of all ownership conflicts, people work it out. It's only... I tell my students this, it's like deviants who end up in court, like people who can't work it out. Sometimes you have to, sometimes it's like, you have to, you know, can't avoid it. But over your dad's rocking chair, you and your sibling should not be in court. Like when, when, when you're, when people pass away in your life, there's like stuff that you want to remember them by, and you shouldn't turn it into a lawsuit. That's like the worst possible choice, uh, worst possible choice you can make. Anyway, so, but that rocking chair, like who gets it? Like, you know, when you, when you're, when you have stuff in your family and you both want it, it came from your parents, like who gets it? There's no answer. The law doesn't tell you who gets it. Like it's another one of these examples. We actually, you have to actually just work it out and we can choose, you know, the one guy, one kid took it first. You know, the other one sued first. You could auction it. There's a lot of different ways you can solve yeah. it. And each one of those choices tells you something about you, not about the law, because there is no law. What it tells you is what do you really value? Do you value time or money, reward yeah. or punishment? Like every ownership battle that we're in reveals like really deep values that we have about who we are as people. Here in LA, when the Dodgers moved here, they moved into um, what was going to be a public space. It was going to be um, a tenement housing back when that was like the answer. And then they're like, yeah, forget that. We're going to turn it into like an expo center, maybe a zoo, all these ideas. But the Dodgers came and then the city's like, no, this is a real win for us. We're going to do that. However, it was occupied by people. And so they made an offer of like $35,000 to anybody who just walks away from their home. You can go buy something yeah. down the hill and no problem, except for yeah. those 10 to 20 families that didn't go. And so what happens? They uh, um, ultimately, years and years later, lots of court battles, the sheriff and a bulldozer come up and they just smash people's houses down. I'm not saying right or wrong, but if you just took that and said, let's double the offer. And like, we understand yeah. this is your home. This is valuable. There was this fight over ownership, and it involved moving a, a bulldozer up onto a mountain, which again costs more than just paying the people out. I mean, there's no way absolutely that it's in anybody's best interest to spend all that court money and sheriff. You know, it's just, but that fight had to happen over ownership. Yeah, it does all the time. So you know, that's a pretty extreme example. Um, and mostly, one of the sort of nice things about America is like if it's your home, it's pretty much yours, and no one can you know leverage you out of it. So unless you basically agree to sell, uh, it's it's you know and sell at your price, you don't have to sell. Now there are some cases where government can get you out. Like if they need your house to like build a highway and there's no other path and they they've picked it, uh, then they can basically pay you the fair market value. So there's a mechanism we call it eminent domain or condemnation. It doesn't happen very often. It used to happen more when we were building the highway system. Now it just happens now and then. And when it does happen, often the people who get screwed basically are those who you know don't have the political power to divert the highway like the next mile over and it goes through their backyards. So one of the things to always do is to be aware, like, you know, these are all choices. Like, you know, who, whose house gets condemned for the, for the new, for the new um, stadium, you know, stadium can go here and it can go there. There's a bunch of, bunch of, bunch of options. So it's basically usually the community that has the least power that gets the one that gets bulldozed. Yeah. Yeah. That's like that whole movie that, um, gosh, Ed Norton did 
with That's Alec right. Baldwin right. about New York. Yeah, yeah. And what was that dude's name? I mean, it's such a powerful story because you have to move forward as New York. You have to, you can't, you have to have free wish. You have to have a way to move people. You have to build things. And that means you have to target the, the cheapest land, which is owned by the poorest people or renting. Yeah. Wait, well, you know, it's, it's, you know, when, when back when, when, you know, um, when Robert Moses was building, building right. New York city, like, you know, the, all the big, um, bridges and highways that sort of created modern New York, um, Triborough, the, the Northern Park State Parkway across Long Island. They had a lot of choices about where, where those highways were going to go. I don't know if you, you're not in New York or I live in New York up off by Columbia where I teach. And it's an absolute mess to get out to Long Island. You have to go all the way up to 125th Street in Harlem, across, and then all the way back down to get out to, to Queens, to get, to get to Long Island. All, that whole extra route was because you know, there was a nice neighborhood that was directly across from where we are that, the, that Moses didn't want to go through. So we just put it through the, the poor community of color. And that's always true. It's like, you know, it turns out that these are all choices. There's no magic natural way for like where you put a highway or any ownership choice, you know, where, whether you lean back or not. It's all a choice that gets determined by a handful of simple rules of ownership. Yeah, these and the, you've got your different designs on what the ownership is. There's, you know, not possession is nine tenths. There's also, um, and I don't know if this is ownership or not, but I think this falls into the category what you're talking about when you talk about chicago versus new york in terms of holding spots in the winter time yeah. another thing that happens for sure in any big city is you know you don't exclusively own the paint on your bumper because you have to park so <laughs> tight and you know this from living in new york like absolutely you're going, you're going to push you're gonna you're not ramming yourself into a car but you are trying to get into a tight space well, you, you basically bump you you bump forward and back until you're more or less in and that's, that's because we all agree experience. we'd like that extra space for an absolutely spot, yeah yeah you know? but you, well, you know a fifty thousand dollar car and you're like yeah smash into it all you want i don't own that space enough you well know? here's the thing you know you shouldn't own par- yeah. there shouldn't be you know free parking on new york city streets at all that's a super valuable resource those parking spaces and the notion that they are basically available to everybody for free is, is nuts. It means that there's way too many cars in New York City, way too much pollution, way too much congestion. If the, if the city actually priced those parking spaces, what they were actually worth, a lot of people would say, you know what? I'll actually take my car out of the city. I don't, I don't, need, to, I don't, need, I don't need to be here. And you know what's happened during the pandemic is so interesting. Like now, uh, the only way for restaurants to survive is to have restaurants outdoors in the, in the city. So all, all the parking spaces up and down the avenues where all the restaurants are, they've all turned into um, a tables and chairs for restaurants. The city actually said, here's a more valuable use for that parking space than you know, a handful of cars. We can actually keep, we can use that space to keep the restaurant industry alive. And that's just, again, ownership is up for grabs. And the city basically shifted it from free parking for you know, well-off people to, um, to restaurant space for the, for the rest of us. It's actually a nice, I thought it was a very, you know, very powerful and it's a good move. Let me ask you a legal question. And so in Chicago around Wrigley yeah. Field, the rooftop owners established businesses, you know, to be able to view the game from their rooftop. Yeah. And there's there's a problem of, hey, you don't have rights to this, you're using it to to do it. But the also the, the Cubs allowed it for decades. And so there's what I would say, and again, I'm not a lawyer, there's yeah. like a tort problem there where the business owner can now say, I've built this business model in something that you allowed me to do. Yeah. You know, like a, a kind of implied contract, but how do you settle something like that? Who does own the um, the air between my eyes and uh, the game? If, you know, if I've got a building, right? So, so you know, homeowners around the field say, "Listen, I've got a great view of the field. Come up, I'll sell you space on my roof, and you can watch the game for free." And that is absolutely the way it should be. Like one of the points that I make to my students, which they are always flipped out about, is ownership. And sorry, not ownership law is massively overrated. Solving these problems through law makes no sense. The basic rule for like views is you should be able to use it. And one of the really surprising strategies of a lot of the most sophisticated companies, we'll come back to baseball, which is a sophisticated company, one of them, one of their uh, like really core advanced strategies is what I call in the book tolerated theft. So like, you know, why does HBO like tolerate, like, and even encourage people to like illegally steal their passwords? It's the same reason why it's okay for Wrigley Field for you to set up a, you know, your, your rooftop, you know, uh, uh, tailgating. Yeah, because it's what they're basically doing, HBO on the passwords, but also for Wrigley Field is they're building fans. Like one of the surprising things for Wrigley Field, for the, for the, for the Cubs uh, game um, team, is that they actually benefit more by having people pirate the view. How do they, you know, how do they do that? They benefit because it builds Cubs fans. Like the last thing you want to do is piss off your best customers, the ones who are willing to go sit on a rooftop for a long distance view. You want them to enjoy the game. 
because eventually they're going to be the fans that are buying bleachers tickets and maybe eventually the more expensive ones. So that strategy of tolerating theft to build a fan base is actually one of the key ownership strategies of 21st century. Actually, my co-author Jim and I have an article in last week's Harvard Business Review, and it doesn't talk about the Cubs, but it talks about a bunch of companies like the Cubs, HBO, Disney, Netflix, that use tolerated theft to build their businesses. There's a concept in Sweden where the land is owned by everybody. Your house is different, but if it's public land, which most of it is, anybody, yeah. can, like someone can walk through your front yard. They could camp yeah. in your front yard if, if it's the right kind of open space. Yeah, We don't have that here across the board, but we have elements of that. And you yeah. guys talk about land use. Let's get into that a little bit. Isn't that, it is so cool. Like people, and when you think about America, like the no trespassing versions, stay off my land. That's not America history. History of America, when the country was founded and until quite recently, people were free to roam across your land, specifically if they were hunting. They couldn't like camp there, but if they were hunting across your land, if they were foraging for blueberries or mushrooms, that was all part of their property right. Like your land, your right as the landowner did not include the right to keep people out for land that was unposted, uncultivated, just like you know, yeah. forest land. Yeah. Um, if you want to keep people up, people out, you could fence it, you could post it, and that and then they had to stay out. But in the background rule was, if, you know, it's free, it's free for people to use it. About half the states have now switched the rule. So in half the states in America, you can't go on to unposted land. And in half the states, you still can. And what that, what that, what that shows for me is that it's gonna, that's a, that's a, um, uh, a version of the same simple stories that with, with, with um, airplane seats and the one we already, already talked about, which is, you know, I'm saying the land is mine because it's, a, you know, the stuff on it, the wild animals on it are attached to my land. Right. Same as that button on the airplane seat. And, you know, you, the forager, are saying, no, 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 it's my labor. You reap what you sow. You know, I was first to capture that animal or that, you know, pick that mushroom. And in, for most of American history, that labor is what counted. It's only quite recently that the attachment, the keep out possession story, the barbed wire story of ownership, that's a very new understanding of ownership in this country. If you own land, like open space, and you, um, have pigeons or pheasant on it or blueberries right. or whatever it is, mushrooms, yeah. you know, yeah. but, but if you create an atmosphere, you know, scrub oak and stuff like that, where yeah. ducks are going to go, they plant, plant it in your riverbed. Yeah. You, know, you, you don't own those dove. You can't, you no. can never produce any document, but they are in sort of yours because you, they're on your land and to get access to them, you have to go ask the farmer and they, they may say, Hey, I charge everybody this, or give me a couple of pheasant. There was yeah. a negotiation, but you really don't own these birds. No one owns them. They're wild animals. It's like, you know, it says they're as free as the air. And that's true for, you know, almost that's true for oil when it's in the ground, water flowing underground. It's true for the air that you breathe. It's all unowned until you actually do what it takes to make it yours. And what it takes to make it yours is always up for grabs. So for those, for those pheasant, it may well be that, the, you know, it's worth it to you to pay that farmer to get access to that riverbed. And then, and then, you know, that's, that's the path in, uh, but you know, the farmer doesn't own them. So that's true. You know, most of these ownership disputes, that, that's a pretty specialized one. I haven't shot pheasant, but if you do, you know, that pheasant are free, free, free wild animals. And yeah. uh, there is no ownership until you actually bag it. Yeah. But I bet that that person owns that land. It's like, yeah, these are my birds. I bet, like, I bet they think of it as theirs. hundred percent, hundred percent. People are like, people get attached to things really easily. Like, you know, that's actually how retailers make a lot of their money. Like the reason that Apple stores have it's like wide open spaces and you can go touch and play with all the stuff is it turns out that they know that if, mm. as soon as you pick up the iPhone off the table, even when it's not yours, it actually becomes actually worth more to you. It's uh, something that psychologists have discovered, uh, and, uh, something called the endowment effect. These two guys, Tversky and Kahneman, won the Nobel Prize for discovering this. That if it's the same item, if you, before you touch it, it's worth one price. And after you're touching it, the same thing, just touch it, it becomes worth more. You're willing to pay more for that same thing as soon as you hold on to it. So that exactly. notion of possession is super powerful in people's lives. That is bananas. Yeah, yeah. And it's how retailers profit from this. They know this. They're like, okay, right. that's why they want you to test drive the car. You're actually willing to pay for more after you test drive it. That's why, they, that's why Zappos will send you shoes that you can send back. It's like, you try them on, you feel like they're yours. Yeah. So it's a real secret for real t retailers.
there must be an escalating scale of that ownership too, where like, you know, Zappos is a great example. Like, let's show you a model wearing these shoes, an actual video. They were the first ones to really sell things with models yeah. wearing the shoe. And like, you didn't just get a picture of the tips of the shoe. You got all these different angles and you could move the shoe around, yeah. which really is the best form of touching that you can do digitally. It's like, oh yeah, you know what? These things do look pretty nice. And oh, look at that in blue pants. Okay. Yeah. It's it's oh, great. I- it's great. as It's the best you can do digitally. and even with that, it turns out we have like two systems in our brains. Mm. Like we have a physical touching system and we yeah. have like the looking online system and they don't actually correspond so well. So as, as good as you can do in, in person, what right. Zappos figured out is we're going to send you the shoes. Yeah. And you can try the shoes on. It's that which actually seals that actually it's that which activates this uh, this uh, endowment effect that, that we discovered. Yeah. And there must be a number, like when we send out shoes, we get 90% of them out the door and they don't come back. You know, the yeah, 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 absolutely. People, you know, people get attached and once they get attached, this very powerful, you know, it is very, it's very primitive. Like this actually goes back and it's one of the first words that kids learn is mine, you know, mm-hmm. mine, 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 you hear in the playground, but it doesn't start there. Like it goes back to our animal territoriality and our possession, animals possession over there, you know, over their, their nesting area. And our shoes actually are a sort of modern version of that. I want to go back to the um, leaning on the law more than it's capable of doing. And, I, and yeah. I love like my friends right now who are landlords are like, they haven't collected a check in a year. Like, yeah, because it's a <laughs> pandemic and people don't necessarily have jobs and yeah. we negotiated a price based on a different reality, you know? Um, and so like back, back when the uh, financial crisis happened in 2008, yeah. there were squattings at homes. You can call the cops and they can come down to that house. And then the person there is like, I've got a rental agreement. Whether that's true or not, it's irrelevant to the sheriff. Yeah. They're like, not my problem. You got to take yeah. it to court. And, and then you can win as the landowner, but still lose because you've had to expend thousands of dollars. Or to- tens of thousands. It's nuts. It is You're nuts. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can win. Yeah. But really, no. Yeah. When you go to court, usually both people lose. But for, yeah, so if you're thinking back like in 2008 with the big financial crash, the mortgage crisis, yeah. you know, there were thousands of people who were like squatting, tens of thousands squatting in yeah. homes around the country. And once someone like, you, you know, in a lot of this, a lot of the states, you can like repel people from, from breaking into your house. Like initially the police will come and defend you. But once they're in, their rights completely change. Yeah. So once they're squatting there, then you need to do a much more complicated process to get them out. And that's been true historically in America for all the way back, that, um, a lot of early American sort of uh, real estate law was about protecting squatters. Like people didn't have good title back in the 1800s. So a lot of American ownership law today for homes traces back to a time when people were settling the West and there were conflicting pieces of paper. And the people who were actually sitting there were able to win more often than you would expect. And that those basic old fashioned sort of Wild West laws still apply today. Now for landlords today, it's really a mess because they have an eviction moratorium, which is, you know, maybe means they don't necessarily get paid, but you're, you still have to pay your bank. Like yeah. your bank has, there's no moratorium on the bank collecting from you as a landlord. So I think that actually the real problem with a lot of the eviction moratorium isn't protecting the tenants, it's that the moratorium didn't really go far enough and didn't take into account uh, the continuing obligations of landlords. You know, most landlords in this country are, you know, they own one building. Like this is their retirement account. Right. Is the retirement, it's not in a 401k. It's in this one, you know, four, you know, four unit apartment that they're trying to manage. That, that, that's it for them. And they have to pay their mortgage even if yeah. their tenants aren't paying them. So I think that's a, a real gap, a real, uh, we missed, um, we missed that when, and when we had all this COVID relief. Um, it's, it's important to protect tenants. Absolutely. Yeah, and yeah, it's important to protect, protect the landlords. Politicians suck at this. You it's know? so hard it's to just, do. Like, you know, it's so hard to do. Yeah. <laughs> Then let's pull that back now and let's look at yeah. a bigger picture, like um, a place like Rhodesia versus Zimbabwe. Yeah. You know, two two people culturally can't get along, refuse to. They have to go to war. And yeah. then in this case, um, you know, the Zimbabwe side wins and there is no Rhodesia anymore. So now yeah. the Rhodesians are scattered to the wind. Yeah. They don't belong to anywhere. They don't own anything. And this is true, like when we talk about like um you know, Indian land. Well, who was the tribe before them? And who was the tribe before them? And it, yeah. you can just go on forever. When do you belong to a place? I'm Caucasian. If I went to their Georgia, they wouldn't say, oh yeah, you belong to this place. It, it wouldn't. So we struggle with these things where, you know, if you're, we've all been nomadic at some point in history, yeah. we've all done different things. I mean, it, but they, someone wants you to belong to somewhere else and they want to claim something for themselves. Yeah. This is a real basic 
you know, this is, this is when you talk about ownership, it's like who gets what and why. And ultimately like every piece of land in America, every piece and every piece of land everywhere in the world um, is, um, has a, you know, has a chain of title. I bought it from you, you bought it from someone, but when you trace that chain back for every piece of land, it goes back to conquest somewhat. And it goes back in many cases in much of the world to a series of conquests and dispossessions and genocides. Um, there's no like natural correct answer to who owns any piece of land or anything in the world. Um, so what we have to do always is think about like um, what is today? How today do we think about what, the, what is the right um, or just or fair way to um, balance cl- claims of people who are here today who have very strong claims. Like, you know, I, I own this land and I, I got it from so-and-so. It's back in my family. That's really meaningful to me. That's who I am as a person is attached to this land. So there's those claims. There's also the claims who, of the people who were kicked off land and uh, in a totally outrageous and unfair, genocidal, horrific ways at some previous point in history. They have no, it's, they don't necessarily have a legal claim, but there are claims for morality and justice um, by how we sort of make right some of these historical injustices. Yeah. And then can you even do it I mean, again? Like you look at like a place like the Balkans, the former Yugoslavian state, yeah. and then every major empire that we study has gone through there. And so there are, yeah. a, you know, there's, you go back 600 years, well, that's not far enough. You got to go further back. Well, that's not far enough. You know, we, that's when we were all Greeks, yeah. these things yeah. can be checked because you cannot convince a Croat, a Bosnian, a Serb that they don't no. own that land that someone else has. You, there's no, no, there's no place in that. Yeah, that's that's going to be true in every place in the world. You know, you think about North Carolina, the, in 1830, the Indian Removal Act basically led to the dispossession right. of the Cherokees who were forced forced west. It's like there's no place where there's an exception from that. But that doesn't mean what, what that means is it doesn't mean you throw your hands up. What it means right. is you say, OK, I, what I recognize is that, you know, uh, possession, one of our six basic stories that everyone uses to claim everything, possession plus time equals yeah. ownership. Um but that doesn't mean we don't think about how do we, um, you know, and there are ways to compensate, you know, part of them are just like, sometimes people just want an apology. Like apologies are actually pretty powerful and pretty cheap. Like we're yeah. really sorry what we did, what we did to your people. Sometimes it's an apology and you combine it with like, you know, here's some, you know, training or money or loans, or, you know, there's ways to basically add on to an apology. There's lots of ways. It isn't like an on off switch where it's either mine or it's yours. It can be like, we can figure out ways to, have people who are currently there, in many cases, um, maintain their ties and have some sort of justice for people who were we, we think were unfairly kicked off. It can be both. That's one of the miracles of ownership is that it can be that there isn't like a single on-off switch, like a light switch version of it. You can actually do like a dimmer and again, so set it at the right level to protect people who are here today and to respect claims of people who were there before. It's just... It is such a, I, I love that you guys wrote this book. It is, it's so, I'm, I've been kind of, I got it just the other day, so I've been able to crush you the whole thing, but I've just been in it and like going, I love it, I love it, I love it. It's so good, everybody <laughs> should get it. It's called Mine. The, uh, the link is there on the board. By the way, if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe, hit the reminder bell, that's how you help. Or just go to breakitdownshow.com, click the PayPal button, just put a little bit of money in the pot, that will help us keep going. Okay, enough about that stuff. I wanted to also... I think I'm right on this. You're the lawyer who studies this kind of thing, but isn't that when Andrew Jackson law, like the case went to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said that's the Indian lands. And then this is where the, the meek shall not inherit the earth. Andy Jackson's like, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, that's right. You know, so if you think about early American history, it was a series, just a series of dispossessions and conquests right. uh, and right. purchases from native tribes. And actually what sometimes happened is sometimes you would have, um, uh, two, um, the only people who get to court, uh, only people who could get to court at the time were white men. So you'd have two white guys suing each other, uh, one of whom had bought the property from the state, Ohio, right. Illinois, and one of them had bought property from a native, native tribe. And they both said, listen, this property is mine. But we both have title. And then the courts have to figure out like, which of these, which of these old dudes actually wins. And what, they, what, they, what the court said is, they used another one of our six basic stories. They said that first in time wins. They said, well, hold on, aren't the Native Americans first? And what that, what, when the court said no, and then what's so, what's so cool about, so ter- the story was terrible for the Native Americans, terrible. But what was interesting from like today's standpoint is that the courts had to figure out like what counts as first. And it's not like kids lining up in a playground. First is always up for grabs, like how you define first. And the way the court said it is the first to chop down trees, the first to do rural agriculture, like the first to basically make New England look like Old England, they're the first in title. So they simply defined first to favor settlers and disfavor natives. But that's not, that's not like some weird law thing. 
That's like true everywhere, all the time, for everything about ownership. It's always a storytelling battle. And whichever story persuades whoever gets to be the decision maker, that's who wins. So what it means partly for you guys as listeners is you got to know what these stories are. Because, you know, the same things that were happening with the natives way back when is like you lining up for the COVID shot today. It's like all those issues are the same basic stories and they're all up for grabs today the same way they were up for grabs way back when. We've had some historians on the show that talk about early American history, because as soon as we think we've got our hands on it, we find out that it's we're way older than 10,000 years. You know, we have oh, to explain sure. why there's, um, uh, you know, Micronesian DNA all throughout the Brazil uh, basin. Yeah. You know, we know now that, that people were here. Every time you think you've got it down, ownership goes further back and further oh, back. Man. And then so you talk about cutting trees and even that's problematic. How does an Indian dude come down? Like, yeah, we had, we were, you know, burning, clearing to make prairie, yeah. let that grow to forest, go over here, burn, make prairie and, and rotating. I mean, absolutely terraforming in the in, sure. in a modern sense. hundred you know? percent. Yeah. So the, the early American courts did not really, they had this image of native Americans stepping lightly through the land and said, that doesn't count as ownership. But native Americans yeah. were f- farming and shifting the land around, uh, burning things. Yeah. Do they had agriculture? It was a much different, the sort of anthropological image of what Native Americans lived like was just wrong. Yeah. But it was too yeah. late for the Native Americans. It, do you know about this Terra Preta stuff in the uh, Amazon basin where over time they just continued to take like fish heads and lightly smolder it? And it's this uber powerful self um, rejuvenating soil that is fantastically wow. for. Yeah. And, and so, Amazing. and they can't figure out how to replicate it. It just is there. And it's for sure man-made, you know? Yeah. And it's, how do you do that? And I'm going to ask you another challenge for the Amazon is like, how do you do that? And keep enough trees standing in the Amazon so we all don't, all of us fry as a planet. That's a real <laughs> challenge. That's a, that's a real ownership yeah. challenge. And it's actually one where the same attachment story, the same button that you use on the airplane mm-hmm. seat, it's the same exact story for protecting trees in the Amazon. Basically treating, treating forest dwellers who aren't owners as if, they own the trees standing, providing the services for, you know, for, for us to be able to breathe. So one of the sort of big advances in environmental protection in the last you know, generation has been thinking about how to create more ownership, more as if ownership for people right. in forests so they don't cut the stuff, cut the trees all down. Yeah, we've had uh, Stephen running, Dr. Stephen running, won uh, the Nobel Peace Prize when uh, Al Gore and everybody else won. And one of the things he talks about is is uh, no nation is really willing to surrender their sovereignty when it comes to the environment. So it belongs to all of us, but none of us want to surrender control of our ownership yeah. to an overseeing body to get us all going in the wrong direction. So U.S.'s carbon emissions have dropped and dropped and dropped. However, China and India have a... It, exploding middle class and upper class yeah. and they yeah. need access to carbon-based things yeah and it's you know, an impossible I, problem you know politics might not solve climate change but ownership right. can like you know basically creating markets so it's worth more to have trees standing than chopped down yeah that's more that's more powerful than than politics like you can tell people yeah. like it's bad for the planet not to, not to chop it down it's bad for the planet if you fill in your wetlands yeah, but if you're like a farmer and you got nothing else besides this land and that wetland, you can you can farm it. You're not gonna you're not gonna leave it as a wetland, unless someone says, "Listen, actually, we're gonna treat the water filtering services that your wetland provides. We're gonna treat that as if you own the, the clean water that comes off it or the air, the clean air." If there's a way to pay you for that, if you own those eco services that your land provides, then suddenly it becomes worth more not to chop yeah. the tree down. Yeah. And that's actually actually it works. Like that's how. Like when you buy carbon, when you fly around, some of your listeners may like buy carbon offsets. Like, like if they feel bad about flying around, they say, I'm going to like try to offset that somehow. What the offset does is pay those people not to chop down trees as if they owned those services that the trees provide. So ownership it's, actually is what creates yeah. the possibility of solving climate change. You have to do that in a way that culturally works too. Let sure. Me just talk for a minute here, but... When we look at the map, the overhead shot of Haiti, Hispanola, right? Haiti and Dominican Republic, the Haiti side, it's a desert. There's no trees and you're not going to be able to reliably put stuff in the ground because the people there are desperate for resources. They just don't have enough. They're not going to have enough. And whenever we get involved, it seems to get worse because we don't do this in a culturally smart way. 
simultaneously, I was in a foreign country. I can't be too specific because some of this could be classified still. But there was a water, an aquifer under the yeah. land that we were uh, working on. And we weren't allowed to tell the local people who, you know, lived above this aquifer that this yeah. resource was there because it would it would cause a weight to the balance of what was going on in the area that we wouldn't, we couldn't reliably do. So part of me gets it because you don't want to like cause more problems, but part of me doesn't get it because it's not ours. <laughs> it's like it's theirs and they should know about it. You know? So we have this, uh, we have this balance of trying to try to get these troubled places going forward, but we, we deny them ownership of something that's clearly theirs or we can't sort we can't sort out how to convince them that these trees are theirs and they're good and then they're going to be able to get by with other resources because of cultural paths that they have. Yeah. So like what you started this that we started that with, which is the difference between the you know Haiti and Dominican Dominican Republic side of, of Hispan of the island. They're both the two countries yeah. on one island. It looks so different. Like that's like it's not like nature that does that. Um and it's not even culture that does that. I mean what it is is really mm-hmm. different rules um and about how ownership works so um in haiti there really uh, hasn't been I actually worked in uh, worked on haiti for a while on, on, on planting um uh, neem trees a very fast growing tree in order to mm-hmm. a lot of the trees a lot of the trees in haiti are chopped down uh, to make charcoal it's like uh, if you're very right. poor charcoal is how you cook, cook your dinner um so the question was like is there a way to like um reforest uh, haiti uh using very fast growing indian trees called neem trees um so that's a sort of a technical solution um, but the, you know, as much as you have like agricultural engineering, like that, that was, an, that was an earlier stage in my career. I think the real solutions today, if I were if I were working Haiti today, wouldn't be agricultural engineering solutions. They would be ownership engineering solutions. Uh, that we think mm. about, you know, agricultural engineering, rocket engineering, but ownership engineering is actually even more powerful. It's how we get through our day all day long, but it also gives you the kind of um, uh, tools that you need to sort of think. If you're a poor Haitian and you need to feed your family dinner, like what's the right ownership regime for trees? That makes you leave the trees intact, actually profit from those, and do something else for your charcoal, or for your maybe instead of charcoal, you use some other kind of fuel. So it's actually possible using ownership tools to engineer that. To, I mean, you, can, you can plant a lot of neem trees, and, and people will still chop them down. The question is, how do you engineer the ownership around them so people have it worth more standing than chopped down? Yeah, it's, uh, Bjorn Lomborg talks a lot about this, especially with Haiti. I don't know how much you know about his work, but he's you know, he talks about the environment. If people are energy poor, they're going yeah. to do things that don't benefit the long-term well-being. And this is what we're talking about in Haiti. Sure. And then how do you convince? Because I've been to Afghanistan, you know, and you're talking to farmers and you're like, yeah. if you use less water, your pomegranates will grow bigger and you'll get more yeah. money for them. Well, they're farmers. They don't believe you. <laughs> they have a system. Yeah. And so you can't just walk in and change it because they own this land. They work this land themselves. Yeah. They own their legacy. Ah, it's so it's so confusing and hard. Mm-hmm. But you're right. That ownership piece, if you can crack the code and make, I don't know, using uh, natural gas has been the answer, right? Yeah. We propose for ha- Haiti. If you can yeah. get them to use that instead of burning not only coal that they make from healthy trees, yeah. but burning it in their home so that they're also toxifying themselves from this charcoal that they breathe in. Yeah, yeah. What a it's, mess. It's, it's, well, here's the thing. This is, you know, it's true in Afghanistan. It's true in Haiti. The exact same thing they were talking about is true in yeah. California, where you're, you're sitting right now. Like the yeah. next time you eat a pistachio or a walnut, like yeah. I guarantee that pistachio or walnut or avocado, it was grown in, in California's Central Valley. Yeah. That is the most valuable agricultural area on the planet. And it's basically a desert. The reason it's valuable is because the farmers with those pistachio trees are pumping an unfathomable amount of water up from that aquifer. It's not like mm-hmm. the country where you couldn't tell them the aquifer existed. They know yeah. it exists. They figured it out. And everyone yeah. sits, sticks their straws into the punch bowl, which means that the Central Valley in places has sunk about 30 feet. Because yeah. aqu- aquifers are like sponges. You suck all the water out. The yeah. land compresses down. Roads are buckling. Uh, um, yes. Houses are cracking uh, in the Central Valley. And it's the exact same thing. You, you tell a pistachio farmer, don't irrigate, irrigate your crops. And his trees die. He has a 20-year investment in those trees. So it's the exact same problem, and it has the exact same kind of ownership solutions. It turns mm-hmm. out that we actually can um, have agriculture and not destroy the aquifers. Like you just mm-hmm. re-engineer how ownership is held. Uh, to you know, not, Instead of having unlimited uh, uh, water draws, you yeah. basically what California has done is they create water districts that create management plans which balance the interests of farmers who need the water uh, some of there's a lot of military bases out there. Military needs the water, um, and there's also you know Los Angeles, 
which needs the water. Like, how do you balance all those conflicting sources? If you just do it by everybody puts their straw in, what you get is everybody has an empty punch bowl. Yeah, no, that's, that's, it's so incredible. It, you reminded me of so many different shows because this really puts its fingers. We got almost a thousand shows here and I could probably do this all day with these shows, but <laughs> we had, um, we had Stephen running on, you know, again, yeah. this guy's an environmentalist and he said, part of our problem is, is that we have these natural resources, for example, natural gas, and then the oil company comes into frack and we don't force them within their contract to capture that gas. We just yeah, waste it. They, they, burn, the they burn it off. Yeah, they burn it off. Right. And so, yeah. so they're going to make a lot of money regardless. And if they capture this gas, yes, it's hard to do, but, you know, for, you know, force the innovation to capture these things and use this, use natural resources because they belong to all of us. I mean, for in sure. Theory. Yeah. You know, although I, I don't have a, I don't have a, a thing signed saying Pete owns the natural gas. <laughs> oh, I want that. That's what I want to see is Pete owns the natural gas. Right. Right. Let's do right, that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then you can hold someone accountable. And if that costs more money on the consumer side, then that's yeah. part of the cost of gaining access to this thing that we own, because well, it is hard to capture natural gas. Well, if you come at this from a sort of a more conservative economic standpoint, what you would say is, listen, the full economic cost of drilling right. includes both the gas and the oil. And it's an unfair subsidy to the gas to the gas to the oil provider if they can just burn off the gas. Now, actually, if we're going to have the full economic cost of gas drilling, I mean, of oil drilling, that has to include the price of the gas that they're otherwise flaring. That's also that's a pretty easy one to solve. And sometimes um, the gas and the oil are owned by separate people. That's a little more challenging to sort of unify those interests in the same place. But where they already unified, it's certainly easy enough to say, "Hey, listen, part of the price of what you're doing is the." Uh, cost of the environment, cost of all the rest of us from flaring that stuff, and that's just part of part of part part of what you price uh, into into your product. The same way that you price it into sol into solar or wind, you have the full economic. If you want to basically have a level playing field, you have the full economic cost of that resource as part of the price that um, that the pro producer sees and that the consumer ultimately chooses. Let's I'm going to choose my energy supplier based on what I think is right for the planet or based on what's whatever cheapest for me. But there should be a level playing field. And there isn't if they can just flare off the gas. Do you, are we able to um, create an ownership for the cost? Like, okay, so um, what, we'll use two examples just to kind of cover our bases here. Yeah. You know, when we want gold, we have to use horrible chemicals and pollute a river to get it yeah. out. But we need gold. Like it's what we need and we value it so much, but we don't charge that mining company enough money to make them, you know, find better ways to do it or, or to right. whatever we want. We want to pay the lowest cost. Same thing with fuel. Um, same thing with, uh, you know, we're desperate to put Tesla's on the road and have batteries run everything. Yeah. However, there's a cost to this, you know, and the it, thermodynamics aren't very friendly with all these things. So we've got yeah. this, all this waste, we've got to scratch down a mountain in a place that's, you know, like Afghanistan has tons of lithium. You know, sure. in there. Yeah. Now you've got to go, you know, get them stabilized enough to make that safe enough that you can put a tree. It gets crazy and super expensive and a heavy carbon footprint to accomplish these things and tearing them down a mountain or digging a giant pit. Yeah. You know, listen, we're, this is true for, you know, all of history. Like we burn yeah. things, we chop things. It's like we all, all of our lives depend on a tremendous amount of resource um, extraction. Um, so the question isn't, are, are we going to extract resources? It's like, you know, are we going to charge? I think, I think the better question is, are we going to charge the full cost for them? So, you know, when you buy a computer and you use it for two years or a cell phone, use it for two years and then toss it, you know, there's a billion dollars, there's, you know, billions of these old cell phones lying around mm -hmm. and they're full of heavy chemicals and um, uh, right. all kinds of stuff that's very hard to break down. But if you can just dispose of them for free, we can just toss it, you know, toss it away. Then Apple basically is getting a big subsidy. They're basically imposing a big cost on the, on the planet. That right. they're not that they're not charging for. So if it costs a thousand bucks for a cell phone, and it costs fifty bucks to break it down, you know Apple should be paying those fifty bucks so that they actually, you know, the full cost, the full life cycle cost of their product should be part of the initial cost. If it isn't, then those costs those costs don't magically disappear if you toss it out. No, they those don't. costs just get borne by all the rest of us. So it's actually a new trend in environmental um, sort of engineering, which is basically having the life cycle cost of the product built in up front. Mm -hmm. So that um, we all pay, uh, there actually is a level playing field. Um, so we all actually pay the real cost of, um, of the stuff that we consume, which we all should do. You know, you know I'm, I'm prepared to pay what it really costs. I don't think I should get subsidized and be able to sort of hurt, the plant, hurt everybody else. So I get something for a little bit cheaper. I'm 
yeah, these these uh, environmental costs, you know, whether it's the ocean or everything else. And, and, it, and again, this goes everywhere. Like if we all own the ocean, it's a closed system. It doesn't seem like it when you turn on the water in your faucet. Yeah. But if you dump things like we've had, again, another guy, William Bonk on and a bunch of these guys talk about the chemicals that we use in uh, weapons. Like right. you can any weapons dumped into the ocean before 1972 legally do not exist. Which is shocking because they actually, they, they in practice exist. And one of the points that you're making there is there's a huge gap between right. what we know to be ownership, we know to exist, and like the law. Yeah. The law is like a really imperfect mechanism for sorting out all of these conflicts. And in, in my, in your daily life, like you lose a wallet or you find a wallet or mm -hmm. you get in line, those are all ownership conflicts and they're not being yeah. sorted out through law. They're like the whole yeah. other set of mechanisms for how we solve really big problems from the environment, but also just in our daily lives. We struggle with ownership in a lot of areas because it is hard to define. You know, you have the, um, I would call it like the three-legged stool of abortion, right? And we're talking okay. about bodies. It's one of the chapters yeah. in there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You have a baby. Yeah. You have, it, like, and again, I saw this great meme. And this is why memes and political cartoons are great. You know, any kind of organism on, the Mar on Mars is life, but a baby yeah. It's not. So we have to struggle. And I, I'm not making a statement either way. It's, yeah. it's just it's just that teetering thing. Yeah. The uh, capability of a dad to say yes or no to being a father. I don't yeah. want that kid. Legally, don't necessarily get to say that. And then, of course, the government compelling a woman to have a baby. You know, like, oh, my God. So how do you yeah. balance this this three-legged problem is it's you have to deny someone some kind of moral right, some ownership, I think. But maybe you're, you're the lawyer. No, me. listen, no, this is, you know. The area that we moved into now is an area where there is law, but you know where every one of your listeners has a strong personal, maybe religious, uh, maybe yeah. um, ethical set yeah. of viewpoints, and it's like that's the terrain actually on which we really need to be having the discussion. It's not really ultimately. I mean, the law there simply reflects, uh, you know, some set of balances of those right. conflicting ethical and, and moral concerns. So one of the ones, one of the ways that we try to think about this actually this is a chapter in the book. I think maybe. People who are interested in this question, it's kind of a useful one. So the, the chapter is our bodies ourselves. And chapter we think, five. you know, yeah, chapter five. So it's actually, um, um, we think of ownership, self-ownership, uh, one of the six basic stories as like either an on-off on switch. Like it's either I own my body or it used to be like slavery in America. Like the history of property in this country was that other people could own African-American people. Like the history of slavery is really deep in American property law. I mean, just in places where you would never expect it. Like, you know, can um, can the NAA, can athletes, uh, can college athletes like sell their, you know, endorsements, like in the sports world? Like that's actually the, the way we discuss that actually is like links straight back to the history of slavery. So areas like today, like what you can do with your body are all sort of have the echoes of this on off switch. You either are owned or not owned um, as a person. So when we have resources that come out of our body, um, our hair that you can sell, you know, blood, um, I mean, plasma, um, eggs, sperm, um, or, you know, services from your body, a woman who wants to be a surrogate, or even all the way to abortion or, 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 or prostitution, services that come out of your body. All of those have this intensely um, uh, personal on-off sense that we usually use. And one of the points that we try to make is it's better to think about ownership as a dimmer switch, where we can try to address the dignity or the sanctity uh, concerns of, say, uh, the, the woman or of the father or of the child without having sort of an on-off, uh, it's only one possible answer. Like, how do we combine uh, the different um, values that are really at stake here about dignity, about coercion, about what it means to be a human being? All of these things are like go to our absolutely deepest values. And there's no like correct legal answer. It's not the law. It's not the law. It's all about like what we think is the right thing to do for the most important stuff, the most important resource there is, which is our ourselves. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I love the dimmer idea, and and you also get to move the dimmer switch, you know, as, yeah. as times evolve. Yeah, we still are desperate to to over to discuss vilely almost Roe v. Wade. You know, we're sure. constantly working this problem, and I wish we could get past it, but. This is a dimmer switch that we just can't decide who owns the, the control on the switch even, you know? Yeah, you know, one of the things that you have to realize about ownership is that it very much is a choice that we have to keep making. It's not like one and done. Like where we set the choice on abortion, um, where we set the choice on prostitution, where we set the choice on, like, can you sell your kidney? Like there's really strong views for and against being able to sell your organs. 
Um, and if you say no, you condemn thousands of people to death every year who are on dialysis. If you say yes, you are like, boy, really poor people just become organ banks for the rich. Like, that's not good. So if you only have these two polar extremes, the on off switch, like, what do you do? You either have, you have basically stuck between two really crappy, out, two really bad outcomes. But if you're like, um, if you think, well, think about the dimmer, or well, maybe there is a way to protect the mm. humanity and dignity of the person who's, who's giving up the kidney and protect the lives of people who are dying unnecessarily from kidney failure. If we can actually do both, I think. Along those same lines, you know, as we get better at keeping people alive, like, you know, businessmen don't die at 52 because they've been smoking and drinking and eating terrible food. You know, we, we live a lot longer. And I saw a number the other day, kids born today are more than 50 percent likely to live deep and to past 100, like 100 to 120. I saw that, too. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. Like a- yeah, uh, but I've also read Gulliver's Travels, and I didn't yeah. just focus on the big and the small. I focused on the world with the immortals. And so, when we, you know, as we fix like the heart problem, it doesn't mean we fix the brain problem or anything right. else. Or, you know, we're working on Alzheimer's. But if I was in a state where my loved ones thought, you know, this isn't what Pete wants. He's been on the record, and he said, just if when I get, but I'm, I'm just nothing but a problem, you yeah. know. That's good for me. Send me to the Rainbow Bridge. Yeah. But we struggle with this. And if you don't have money, you can't just fly to Switzerland or, or go to some place that's you know euthanasia friendly. Yeah. But at some point, we're going to have to deal with that part of our our reality because getting old isn't. I mean, you look at like once you get to sixty, the pace of age changes so dramatically and obviously for people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's absolutely right. And then you know, one of the challenges for like who gets what and why for the stuff that we have today in our lives. It's like, what, how do we think about that in a world where not just each of us individually, individually are getting older, but how do we think about it in a world where like collectively as a society, people are living, having like really engaged, productive, full, vibrant lives into their 70s, 80s, 90s. My uncle, actually, my uncle is 101. Um, wow. And he is, yeah, so, so cool. He's like a, and he's a super, he's super sharp. He's still like, he, he's, um, he edits plays um, th- that he can then direct um, to um, put on stage at the place where he lives. So he oh, has like great. a cast of characters. He's out there directing. He's a like captive audience. <laughs> he's got kind of captive audience. I mean, it's not always the same audience from show to show, but he's like he um he is a hundred percent with it um and a hundred percent involved. So we have to think about ownership in a world where like right now he's an extraordinary rare exception, but like in you know in a few decades he won't be. Um, we'll still have the same six ownership stories. Those don't change. Those go back to the Bible, actually way before it, and they go forward you know into the future. Uh, and they work in Afghanistan and Haiti, and they work here in the California Central Valley. It's the same simple stories. But what we do have to do is think about how do we adjust that for a world where people are living such radically different lives? Like one version of that is like, what can you pass on to your kids in terms of inheritance? Yeah. You know, what do you pass on to um, your kids in terms of values? Like all of those have an ownership component uh, to them. Um, and like also, you know, if you say, pull the plug on me, like what does it mean for your organs? Maybe they're still useful. For uh, for somebody who you know maybe one you know one person who has you know dies uh, in a fairly healthy way can have organs that can save a half dozen lives. Like organ donation itself is an ownership question. That's a very live question for uh, saving potentially thousands or tens of thousands of lives in this country if you did it in a smarter way. Yeah, yeah, and this is a thing that we're going to have to deal with. And, and, and this may not, may not realize this, but a speech therapist in a in a retirement center makes the call a lot of times like this is it no yeah, more yeah you know for sure and it's just not a doctor this is a speech therapist who's like their body no longer works in a way and so they own this life and death decision and again like once you're there you know that's a problem and the other point is is um what if you're 98 and you're like i'm having a bad day i'm done i don't want to be around anymore give me the pill and then you take the pill or or do you like hey you know tomorrow you always do this tomorrow you're in a better mood yeah you know and like how do you guide someone down this path that they're going to inevitably go? Yeah. But you don't want it to be you know, like the cooling off period. Like, well, I got to wait two weeks to die. You know, it's you know, I have a, I have a number of hats as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, you know, guy who writes about stuff. And this book yeah. is, this book is about like, you know, super cool, fun stories, like blow your mind, you know, right. economics, nudge, you know, kind of th- that kind of stuff. I have another hat that I wear, which is, uh, more sort of you know, fancy property theory. And one of the things we start to think about a lot is exactly the question uh, that you talk about, like, what does it mean to make a choice? What does it mean to make a choice? Right. Uh, and, you know, it's really, it's so important that people's choices be fully informed on the one hand, and it's also important that people be free. 
like to make their own choices. Um, and that isn't, there's not like a magic answer to that. What there has to be though, are procedures that make what, what we call um, cooling off periods, basically. Um, so people don't make rash or opportunistic decisions about the most important issues in their lives. Like when you, when you get divorced, for example, and there's no way, you know, you can get divorced in this country. If you want, if your marriage is coming to an end, uh, you can't lock yourself into it. Uh, but you also can't leave overnight. Like in some cultures, you can leave, you can get divorced. You can say, I divorce you, and they're divorced the next day. But that leads to really opportunistic divorce. Yeah. So what we have in this country is a cooling off period. Like you need to do six months or some kind, some places a year. But that cooling off period is the same issue with like, you know, end of end of life decisions. Like you want people to have informed decisions, but you also want to protect their autonomy. So how do you do a, How do you get a balance that protects both of those values? And the answer is, you know, you, you can. You, know, you, you can do it by uh, sort of thinking creatively about uh, what the right process is that protects mm -hmm. people's autonomy, but gives us some confidence as a society that some random person isn't pulling the plug on someone you love. This is, again, I, I love the way you guys have done this and the Freakonomics thing is always incredible. And you found this fantastic forum to tell the story. I guess my last question is just, as you did this, what didn't make it in the book or what's the big revelation where you're like, I never thought about this. This has changed completely how I see things. Either one. Well, well I mean, what didn't make, we had a ruthless audition process for this book. Like each story that was in the book, it had to be like super fun totally counterintuitive or absolutely infuriating. Right. Um, and we wrote that, like, we don't expect lawyers to be reading. This book is not for lawyers. This book is to like pick up, you know, back a few, it was, we actually, the original idea was we wanted this book in airport bookstores. If you like, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, if you don't want like the celebrity magazine, when something fun to read, like that was our challenge to ourselves. It had to be a absolute page turner. I hope that, I hope it was. What was most surprising for me is like, and what I learned I, I've been teaching property for 25 years. I have had thousands of students. I, until I wrote this book, I didn't realize like that there are just these handful of simple stories. Like, you know, you reap what you sow, first come, first serve. So the ones that we've talked about, there aren't any others. Like, that's it. Like, that's yeah. self-ownership. Like, that's how everyone claims everything in the world. And it's the same simple stories that kids use on the playground and businesses use to move us around. Like, what, what so surprised me is like, I walk around my life. And like, I go, I see a line. I say, like, are people being paid to stand in that line? Like, why did the owner set it up that way? Like I see, you know, um, just outside my window here, I see um, uh, all these uh, seats and tables on this, on, you know, on Broadway Avenue. Like, like, hold on, who really owns that space? In, you know, in front of, in front of the restaurant, like that's right. city space is my space. Is it, can I sit down in the chair or not? Like, uh, um, you know, if I get a COVID vaccine, there's a second vaccine, mine. What, I, what, what was so surprising to me was that there's a handful of stories and they control so much more than I realized. Anyway, what I realized also is I, once, once you know that, you can do something about it. Like, I, I, now, I now have a better sense of like how to like, like, for example, on the airplane story, like the wedge of seat, can you lean back or not, what we started with. Like, it turns out that if you pay the guy in, uh, behind you, you pay, you pay the guy in front of you, you offer him 20 bucks not to recline, that doesn't work so well. If you offer just yeah. if you ask them just don't recline onto me, it doesn't work so well. But about three quarters of the time, if you just buy them a drink or a snack, like people won't recline onto you. Yeah. If you want to if you want to do some work, it turns out that you know creating some community actually makes a difference. So it turns out that there's really simple ways that you can take back that remote control of ownership to make your life like a better life. I love it, man. It's it's such a great book. So again, it's called Mine. It's right here. Oops, it's right here. You guys should definitely get this thing. I'm absolutely enjoying it, recommending it to all of my friends. Let me uh, roll this thing. Thank you so much for coming on. I, I mean, you've been all over the place talking, and I was watching you live earlier. I, hopefully, I got you to some different areas. But I just, I, oh, I want to say one more thing. One more thing. In my hometown, Fourth of July parade, you can put your chair or chalk. Oh, draw I love it. Out. No way. Except you can draw. A, you can draw a chair outline and chalk. A whole, bo a whole family oh, box. Oh, yeah. really? On the parade I, route? It's getting longer and longer, like longer waiting times, like two weeks out. People are like, this is going to be our square, right? Oh, my and, God. I love it. See, that's such cool pushback. stuff. Yeah, it's so cool. Yeah. And then we push back. And so someone put free chairs ad on Craigslist for downtown Benicia. Yeah, so if you put your chair out there, someone on Craigslist is like, I need some lawn chairs. <laughs> <laughs> Right. This is one. This is one of the stories we tell in the book, which is in, in Boston. If you put, if you right. dig your car out, 
you put a chair in, it's your space in the space. It's your space, and people know not to mess with the space. It sounds like in Bernice, it's the same thing. It's not snow, but it's the parade. I love parade. it. I love it. I love Someone it. might challenge you on it, and they're from New oh, York. And- yeah, hey. well, listen, that's that that that's the real life of ownership. Is you know, yeah. drawing that chalk line at the right time. <laughs>